the nations shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says Yahweh of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says Yahweh. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, and in this place I will give peace. Haggai 2, 7-9 this can't be referring to the temple Herod remodeled, just in time to be visited by Yahshua, for no peace was forthcoming from the temple during his first century advent. None of this expectation will be lost on the Antichrist. In fact, I believe, give us a speculation factor of five, that in the wake of, or perhaps as a part of, his landmark treaty assuring peace between the Jews and the Muslims, he will persuade the world to turn the Temple Mount into some kind of ecumenical worship center. The Dome of the Rock, the third <laughs> holiest site in Islam, is already there, of course, built in the late 7th century to commemorate Muhammad's night's journey. Uh, this is the hallucination he had in which he went to the temple, which wasn't there at the time, and from there to heaven upon a mythical flying jackass called a Barak. Mind you, he was at the Kaaba when he had the dream, effectively demonstrating that you can't get to heaven from Mecca. The question of the hour will be, must the dome be destroyed in order to make room for the Jewish temple? Many temple enthusiasts today insist it must because, they say, it occupies the exact spot upon which Solomon's and Ezra's temples were built. It is reasonably certain that the dome was built upon the foundation of the 2nd century Roman temple to Jupiter, read Tammuz, right down to the octagonal footprint. A nearby Roman basilica on the southern end of the temple mount provided the foundation for the al Aska Mosque. The traditional view is that both the Roman temple, which was retasked to Christian purposes after Constantine's conversion, and the subsequent Muslim shrine were built at the site of Herod's grandiose redo of the Second Temple. Two questions remain. Was it, and if so, did Herod build at precisely the same place Solomon had? There are at least two other theories that are clearly plausible. Bear in mind that the Temple Mount is huge. It covers 45 acres. To help you get a clear picture of this, a football field is about one acre. It is a roughly trapezoid-shaped platform, surrounded by a retaining wall. Its width is 910 feet on the south side and 1,025 feet on the north. The length is 1,520 feet on the east and 1,580 feet, about three-tenths of a mile, on the west. Considering the relatively small footprint of Solomon's temple, if you exclude the court of the Gentiles, there would be plenty of room up there to put a new Jewish temple, plus a Christian cathedral, plus shrines for several other popular religions, up there without removing the Dome of the Rock and without any serious overcrowding. I believe that this is precisely what the Antichrist will propose, a place where all of the world's great religions can come together in peace and harmony, a sort of equal opportunity New Age Acropolis. If truth is relative and God is all in your mind, it makes perfect sense. Devout Jews, of course, will be mortified, but they will have little choice in the matter. By the time this happens, their very existence will be endangered. It will literally be a case of put up or shut up. Mount Moriah is actually a ridge running roughly north to south through old Jerusalem. Its highest peak is actually a few hundred yards north of the Temple Mount, outside the old city wall, near the ancient limestone quarry once known as Golgotha, the place of the skull. The mountain's bedrock base is relatively flat on the northern end. It peeks through the pavement inside the Dome of the Rock, but south of the shrine, the natural mountain slopes downhill. The platform there is supported by pillars and arches. The southeast corner of the Temple Mount is a good 150 feet higher than the bedrock that supports it. So, where was the temple? 
Tuvia Sagiv, a prominent Israeli architect, has championed a site to the south of the Dome of the Rock. Though tradition places the Roman garrison, the Antonia Fortress, to the north and adjacent to the Temple Mount, Sagiv places it in the center of the Temple Mount, right where the Dome of the Rock stands now, with Solomon's Temple at a lower elevation, down the hill to the south, closer to the city of David. Some background. Ancient sources report that Herod's temple was the highest building in Jerusalem, that is, until he, in deference to his Roman masters, built the fortress of Antonia even higher. Josephus says that the view of the temple from the north was blocked by the Bazita Hill, which is the summit of Moriah, just behind Golgotha. What the view of Moriah didn't block, the Tower of Antonia would have. I'm having trouble buying into Sagiv's southern theory for several reasons. First, David and Solomon, out of reverence for Yahweh, would have placed the temple on the highest bedrock they could find within the city walls. Golgotha, or Bezita, though higher, is outside the old city. Second, the southern end of the Temple Mount was built up to a level platform only in the days of Herod. Uh, You can still see the signature Herodian beveled edges on the huge foundation stones of the western wall. So there would be no elevation differential to speak of over the whole 45-acre complex. Indeed, the place called Solomon's Stables were beneath the arch-supported southern end of the mount. I can imagine the high priests might have had something to say about placing the Holy of Holies over a stable. Remember, Herod was a practical man. The whole reason for remodeling the second temple in the first place was to bribe the Jewish establishment into accepting him, an Edomian, not a Jew, as their king. And that scenario is starting to sound awfully familiar. Sagiv has other reasons for suggesting a southern temple site, but most of them seem to be based on assumptions concerning present-day landmark elevations in Jerusalem. The modern city is built many feet above the actual historical locations. The rubble from being raised and rebuilt again and again over the last three millennia makes elevation calculations a highly speculative endeavor. And I can't get over the fact that ancient temples were never built halfway down a hillside when there was a convenient bedrock summit nearby. Look at the Greeks' Parthenon, for example. That brings us to the second non-traditional site for the temple, the Northern Conjecture. Dr. Asher Kaufman, a former professor of physics at Hebrew University, has for several decades been advocating a location 330 feet north of the Dome of the Rock. I told you the place is big. The bedrock of Mount Moriah's summit is just beneath the paving stones for that whole distance. Kaufman places the Holy of Holies at the small Muslim-built structure called the Dome of the Spirits alternately called the Dome of the Tablets. This octagonal shrine lines up precisely with the eastern, or golden gate, facing the Mount of Olives, the one the Muslims filled in with stones centuries ago. The east gate is the source of Muslim concern and Jewish hope because of the words of the prophet Ezekiel. Afterward he, the angel, brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. And the glory of Yahweh came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the temple. Ezekiel 43, 1 and 2, 4 and 5. This explains why, from time immemorial, the Jews have buried their dead on the slopes of the Valley of Kidron right outside the eastern gate. They want to be the first to experience the returning Shekinah, the glory of Yahweh. It also explains why Muslim graves crowd the opposite side of the valley and why they've blocked the eastern gate with massive stones. They want to stop God from entering the city. I don't get it. If Allah and Yahweh are the same, which is what they'd like you to believe, then they're trying to stop their own God. 
If Yahweh isn't God, we've got nothing to worry about. There's no point in trying to prevent the arrival of someone who doesn't exist. But if Yahweh really is God, how do they expect a bit of masonry and a few Muslim ghosts to stop him? Well, logic has never been the Islamic strong suit. The eastern gate will be shut, but not by Muslims. Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces towards the east, but it was shut. And Yahweh said to me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter by it, because Yahweh, God of Israel, has entered by it. Therefore it shall be shut. Ezekiel 44, 1 and 2 As we shall see in chapter 26, millennial temple architecture, including its location, won't have a whole lot in common with what we see in historic Jerusalem. Ezekiel's eastern gate and Herod's are two different things. But if you're interested in how the gates of Jerusalem figure into coming events, ponder this. Have mercy on me, O Yahweh. Consider my trouble from those who hate me, you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I might tell of all your praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in your salvation. Psalm 9, 13 and 14. Besides the prophecy concerning the direction from which the Spirit of God will enter the temple is the fact that the door of the temple, all the way back to the wilderness tabernacle, was supposed to face the east. Lining it up with the eastern entrance to the mount therefore makes perfect architectural sense. The fact that the Dome of the Spirits lines up with the eastern gate, then, is significant circumstantial evidence. It should be noted that the Temple Mount today is under the supervision of the Waqf, the Supreme Muslim Council, who have consistently forbidden any systematic archaeological investigation of the site. But Yahweh, who is not particularly impressed with Muslim councils, has providentially, if not miraculously, opened some avenues of insight. A few years back, during a severe drought, four cisterns atop the Temple Mount began mysteriously filling with water. The Muslims, whose God doesn't do miracles, envisioned a massive plumbing leak in the pipes beneath the platform. Panicked, they started pumping out water and tearing up paving stones, trying to find the problem. In their quest for the leak, the Muslim technicians inadvertently unearthed the south foundation wall of Solomon's Temple, only a few meters north of the Dome of the Spirits. This confirmed Kaufman's hypothesis that the Dome of the Spirits marked the location of the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum of Solomon's temple. The water, by the way, was no miracle. It turned out that somebody had been overwatering the olive trees on the north end of the temple mount. Michael Rood, a self-described messianic rabbi, happened to be in Jerusalem at the time and heard about the strange goings-on. Rood says that he, pretending to be an ignorant American tourist, went up to the Temple Mount and examined the Dome of the Spirits, or more specifically, its floor. The Dome of the Spirits is an eight-sided structure, but a careful examination of the floor revealed that its base is actually one large square stone whose whose corners project out beyond the dome's supporting pillars. In the center of each edge of the floor stone is a square keystone. Rood sensed that there was more to this pattern than mere aesthetics, since the whole floor of the temple would have been covered with cypress planks, as it says in 1 Kings 6.15. After being chased off the temple mount by angry Muslim watchmen, he actually had to be rescued by the Israeli police, Rude formed a hypothesis he hoped would unlock one of the greatest mysteries of all time. Whatever became of the Ark of the Covenant?